everyone is responsible for make doing their own due diligence. I think it's very good for the crypto industry to become more accepted and also to protecting customers. All of these parties now need to have their ads approved by a registered approver uh, or they need to be registered here in the UK. And sometimes uh, I think especially in our industry and in our community we fear there is not enough or there isn't the right education. Fighting Financial Crime with Lynn McConnell, Head of Compliance, MLRO at GreenGage. Hi, Lynn, how are you? Uh, fine. Uh, thank you, Stefania, for having me. Well, let's start with a short introduction because you are a um, well-known figure in the crypto space, but also in the traditional finance. I know that you were FDS, FCA many years ago. So I want to give you the stage for a quick and short introduction. Well, thank you. Um, I started out my career in the United States as a bond specialist for Bank of America Securities, where I worked for 12 years in the bond department. And I moved overseas. Um, I was uh, a supervisor at the FSA, uh, during the financial crisis. And then since then, I've had about 10 years in uh, compliance with RBS and Barclays. And I went into crypto in 2018 uh, when I was working in Gibraltar. I uh, was familiar with the Gibraltar DLT framework that they set up. I went to California, did an a environmental blockchain data startup. I went, came back to London, helped to set up a digital custodian. Then I went to Binance for three years in compliance. And now I work with GreenGage, which is a digital finance pioneer, as the head of compliance in the MLRO. And uh, we're very excited about uh, our product offerings. And we currently are working with Modular as an uh, EMI distributor and in the payments area. Thank you. Wow. So you've got such an interesting background. And I guess the, you know, your time at Binance was quite challenging as well, because, you know, establishing them in Europe was kind of like a new thing for uh, one of the largest uh, crypto companies in the world. Well, um, I had the privilege of working uh, here in the compliance function in the UK and then moved to France last year to work on the um, registration and the launching of Binance France's uh, cryptocurrency exchange. But um, my uh, activities have really broadened um, into uh, broader compliance issues, fighting financial crime, and looking at um, payments more broadly as uh, I'm working now with back in the UK with an EMI distributor. I couldn't have a better person than you than discussing uh, this uh kind of a harder topic because of fighting financial crime, you know, is something that uh, obviously matters a lot. And when we start to talk about crypto and we start to talk about how these new technology are changing the financial industry, there is so much of unknown and that's the space where financial crime proliferate. So I'm really glad that you're here. And um, let's dive deep into these uh, subjects. So I'm going to ask you a dumb question. But might not be so dumb. What is a financial crime? Well, it's any illicit uh, uh, financing activity, and we have all sorts of financial crime, uh, credit card fraud, uh, illicit transactions uh, on the uh, Internet, uh, frauds and scams, hacks. You know, we have it gets into use of various types of uh, money or currency in human trafficking, drug deals. So you have a very, very broad uh, aspects of financial crime, but uh, often you're using basically the financial flows to track down uh, some of the criminal activities and identifying uh, the proceeds of crime under the UK crime, uh, UK regulations. I think many people are familiar with uh, some bank and fraud and uh, the recent conviction of the fraud that he did with uh, FTX. So we couldn't, uh, you know, be discussing kind of like any more difficult subject, but also quite prominent uh, as well in today, um, you know, discussion. Now, regulation. We said already that regulation sometimes uh, could be is challenge, is not out there yet, but you know, it's trying to like to help the cryptocurrency industry to become more mainstream by protecting uh, 
customers. Anyway, I don't want to say much. I'm pro-regulation. I think it's very good for the crypto industry to become more accepted and also to protecting customers. But I would like you to give me your update on how you see a regulation moving forward. Uh, what do you see the pitfall? What do you see the good things on a global scale? And then if you want to focus more perhaps on the UK and Europe, uh, that will be great. Well, first of all, I think we are all in a, a currently and have been for the past five years, three years maybe, uh, in an evolving regulatory landscape globally. Some countries, um, the smaller countries, some of them in Europe, you know, Slovakia, for example, have just said we're waiting for the European regulatory framework, which is now known as MECA, to be set up. So some countries have done very little. Other countries have um, taken the approach to use anti-money laundering regulation as the initial starting point. So uh, with the support of organizations, global bodies that are standard setting bodies like the FATF headquartered in Paris, uh, which sets standards for financial, uh, fighting financial crime globally and also evaluates countries on a national basis uh, on their efforts to fight financial crime. They are uh, one of the leading bodies in uh, starting out the path of getting regulation and financial crime addressed. So the UK and uh, some of the other countries in Europe have all set up anti-money laundering regulations to register cryptocurrency uh, exchanges and other uh, service providers such as custodians uh, for regulatory purposes for um, anti-money laundering. So countries like Spain, where well, the Bank of Spain has an anti-money laundering unit, uh, Italy, uh, Lithuania has their financial intelligence unit, which is the supervisor for registration for cryptocurrency uh, exchanges there. That would be like having the National Crime Agency as your supervisor uh, and overseeing the um, compliance with money laundering regulations. Here in the UK, we have the Financial Conduct Authority that was named by the government as the uh, AML supervisor. And they have maintained very high standards in uh, authorizing or registering um, service providers here. Uh, as you know, they had a temporary register for a year when the regulations came into effect in uh, January of 2020. So we have now um, recently the um, FISMA, the Financial Services and Market Act, has been updated here in the UK. And so they are extending some of the provisions that apply to the traditional centralized banking and investments community uh, over and to the cryptocurrency uh, service providers here. We also have had a major change this past month in October. The financial promotions regime has come into effect, and that is uh, entirely regarding uh, protecting consumers and ensuring that any party that makes a cryptocurrency advertising or promotion that can be seen or is visible in the UK, whether it's uh, an ad on a bus or uh, uh, a website that can be seen from the UK, uh, which includes overseas uh, service providers. All of these parties now need to have their ads approved by a registered approver, uh, or they need to be registered here in the UK. So I think the FCA was expecting to have some overseas firms apply for approvals to be able to make financial promotions regimes. We may, uh, uh, um, financial promotions here in the UK, and we may see some more of them applying. But right now, it's in early, uh, early days. Uh, the FCA has published a warning list uh, of uh, non-compliant um, parties. So everyone is watching this space and working on it right now in the cryptocurrency compliance area. Do you think uh, there is a problem of education when it comes down to regulators? Because they are the one, you know, they have to make sure that there are standards for the industry, for this nascent industry to do business. Uh, and sometimes... Uh, I think especially in our industry, in our community, we fear there is not enough or there isn't the right education because, uh, you know, sometimes people can just uh, look at the media or look at those buzzwords, but they 
because it's all underpinned by technology, you also need a deep understanding of technology in order to see what the technology can do in a specific market, like could be the financial market. I, I would like to, to pick your brain and, and uh, maybe see what you think about this education mystery around regulation. Well, first of all, uh, let's talk about the regulator. Um, here in the UK, the SEA has made uh, an effort uh, in the last uh, year to hire more staff, both for the authorization team. Uh, they have a specific supervision team for crypto asset companies uh, involved in the industry. Um, they have um, tried to add staff that has more uh, technology background. As a regulator, the FCA is well known for its uh, outstanding efforts with regulatory sandboxes, which have been going for more than five years. They have tech sprints where they're interacting with fintechs and trying to promote innovation. So I think they are trying to address the uh, knowledge of technology and support technology uh, through some of their regulatory uh, interactions with the fintech community. Um, however, uh, you know, all regulators need to also make sure that they are meeting their overall regulatory objectives. And here, the uh, FCA is very concerned about protecting consumers. So they have very high standards for that, regardless of what the industry uh, structure is. So long as they can make sure they have sufficient staff to understand the technology and to be able to interact appropriately with the applicants and assess them fairly, that is what a regulator needs to do. And they are in the process of doing that, and they have added more staff to become even more effective. So over time, I believe that they're going to be able to process applications uh, more applications you know, per year and help the industry to grow. But that will take some time to, uh, to, to become uh, active, I think, um, as they're working on it. So um, in terms of other, uh, in other jurisdictions, uh, you know, both uh, many European countries have the same regulatory approach. They have an AML supervisor and they have a supervisor that also is uh, protecting consumers and viewing marketing. So in Spain, you have the Bank of Spain anti-money laundering unit, and you have a separate CNMV, which is covering marketing and uh, consumer activity. There, they have decided to put a warning notice that is mandated by the government on all of their advertisements. So they are doing very explicit risk warnings to heighten the sensitivity uh, around uh, the high risk of these investments and ensuring that Spanish, you know, potential customers will understand or be aware of the risk that they are taking. This is particularly important in uh, markets where influencers are often used by large fintech companies to promote exactly. a product. Exactly, exactly. Go so, on, because they apply, you know, to many influencers, like my fellows, influencer all over the internet, YouTube, social media, and, you know, we have seen a massive increase of influencer over yeah. the last couple of years, so. That goes to the topic you were referencing earlier about uh, consumers and, and education. So they have this expression, as you know, in our industry, D-Y-O-R, do your own research, capital letters. Everyone is responsible for make, doing their own due diligence. So if you decide to open an account with a cryptocurrency exchange, you can go on the Internet and there's some services uh, that will provide ratings for various cryptocurrency exchanges. You can go on coinmarketcap.com and, and you know, learn about some of the exchanges. So you can always check out uh, a service that you're considering before you buy. Second of all, consumers can uh, educate themselves with material on the internet. It has varying quality. There's some good YouTube explainer videos. There's a lot of material out there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, news services, crypto news services that you can use and that also have some education on their websites. But most importantly, the major exchanges have large uh, sections uh, that have an academy or learning corner where you can get a lot of information on specific products if you want to read up on DeFi or meme coins or trading or learning more about derivatives. All those are available on all of the major uh, exchange websites. But what I do think is that the in society, whether it's through the school system and learning basic digital skills, or we need more training in society for all levels of society, 
uh, the reason I say that is because we have some older people that are getting scammed by people who are um, uh, pretending to be uh, Bitcoin investors on, uh, you know, Instagram and YouTube or whatever. And it's completely, they're completely taken in and we have some scam situations that are quite serious uh, and very large money laundering rings um, that have harmed a number of elderly people that have you know, given the money and not really understood that they were not dealing with a regulated investment firm. So we need more society education at all levels. Yeah. But um, the young people now coming out of school, are, you know, they're all completely mobile phone, uh, mobile device uh, oriented. So they're pretty good at understanding how to use a mobile device. But we all need to understand the interaction of the parties yeah. on the internet and how we are, you know, and how someone can scam you and how easy that is. I think it does, uh, it does apply also to the old traditional financial market of equity, for example, is all the same story. You always need to do your own research. There is no quick win and whatever, even if there is, because, you know, sometimes you are there at the right time and, you know, you can also make a lot of money. It's always down to yourself, your decision is your responsibility, is your money. Never invest more than you can afford to lose. That's rule one. And be, you know, be conscious that you decided to do it and never blame other people because you are the one making the decision. And, you know, I know so much that when uh, people say you can make 10x, you can make 20x, sometimes it does happen. You know, it's not that it's impossible, but it's not there is a lot of risk. The risk in crypto is that exponential if we compare it to uh, even small cap company on the stock market. So, you know, always education, like you said, Lynn, do your own. Whatever product it is. Yes. Exactly. And, you know, all the content we do here on the Financial Fox has never been and never will be financial promotion is just for information purposes and is always down to you to make your own decision about and, anything and, you do with your own and money. And secondly, do 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 diligence on the party you're dealing exactly. with. Exactly. Not exactly. just the product, but also uh, is the firm registered? Uh, are they registered in the UK? Are they registered overseas? You know, whatever you can do to, to make sure you're dealing with, um, you know, responsible and compliant counterparty yeah. as a trading firm would be an appropriate step. Okay, let's talk a little bit about banking, which uh, has been uh, uh, a problem with some prominent figures as well in the UK, like Nigel Farage. Uh, and when it comes down to cryptocurrency, obviously, then there, we are adding another problem and many you know crypto project or web3 project they find it hard to bank um, and there's been lots of scam as well in the space so how do you see banking and cryptocurrency coming together or perhaps banking innovating in a way that cryptocurrency become a part of the this value exchange very big question um I will say that uh, there has been a lot of publicity recently. Uh, Nigel Farage has been just, uh, his, his account experience as described in the press has been something that has brought, uh, I think, to the fore the fact that some uh, organizations will make decisions around what risk they, they have as their risk appetite. And um, I'm not really going to comment on his case, but there are cases where banking organizations um, in dealing with their consumer customers have decided they don't necessarily want to have very large amounts of payments made to cryptocurrency exchanges. And so they have been limiting those or uh, telling customers that are doing transactions with cryptocurrency exchanges that they don't want them to bank with them anymore. So there is a uh, somewhat of a moderate debanking trend that is beginning to become apparent. And so... Um, there are payment services companies, uh, which do include Greengage, uh, that are willing to work with customers that are uh, businesses um, and some individuals who are involved with uh, cryptocurrency in their business or their private uh, trading. And they would like to have an, a payment services account that uh, has assessed that and that they are comfortable using to make payments back and forth, uh, you know, in connection with those types of transactions. So we are able to evaluate that and are able to assess um, those customers and have uh, taken some of them on. So for example, uh, a digital art gallery that might receive payments in both fiat and crypto. 
um, we have a foundation, an educational foundation that has received donations uh, in crypto, and they are giving educational grants. So they need to be able to convert the crypto from time to time into fiat to pay their expenses and, and to send their grant money out. So we're able to help all types of customers that are uh, working in this industry, Web3 entrepreneurs. We have a lot of entrepreneurs in the fintech area that are coming to us uh, increasingly. So we have those dialogues and we're starting to see some traction in that area, helping those types of customers. Okay, so when you are a business operating, a business like Green Gage operating into this um, very challenging space, tell me a bit about the role of compliance, the challenge in compliance, uh, what perhaps, uh, you know, if you want to use uh, Green Gage, an example, or other company you work in the past, um, you know, how you make sure that you are following the rules, you are compliant, and sometimes maybe the effort that you have to take, something you have to do more in order to uh, work within the lines uh, that regulation gives you, the direction that regulation gives you? Okay, well, first of all, any uh, payments firm, uh, regulated payments firm, is going to have uh, uh, their directors uh, and their MLRO are responsible for compliance with the UK money laundering regulations, which are the money laundering regulations 2017 as amended in 2019, and there have been further amendments in 2022, and the Proceeds of Crime Act. So those are the regulations that everyone is focused on becoming compliant with uh, before day one. Then you have your AML risk assessment that you make for your business and you look at your AML risks and then you take controls and have risk and controls around that to uh, mitigate the risk of financial crime. You then conduct your identity and verification on your customers. Each one will provide identity such as driver's license, passport, proofs of address, other information. We also do due diligence on the companies themselves. Uh, we do checks at companies' house, and we have other due diligence. Uh, we have uh, outside services we use. We also do um, authentication of documents and uh, confirmation with data services. So we use reg tech tools that are widely uh, you know, known in the industry, and there are always new reg tech tools that are coming up. I'm very excited about the application of AI. Uh, we've been looking at a recent company called Zapian that uses uh, artificial intelligence in terms of your adverse media checks that can speed things up tremendously. Um, so those are all the types of things. So I think good financial crime officers everywhere are trying to, at the same time, do their actual work with the customers and also keeping their eye on the developments in reg tech tools as uh, that is an emerging uh, area where we can uh, begin to pick up on um you know, efficiencies in the amount of uh, work we have to do. So that's kind of in a nutshell what you're doing uh, as a good uh, financial crime officer anywhere. I think that's great that you mentioned about uh, um, new technology for reporting, because I was just going to ask you that some of the reporting tools uh, might be out to date, so you might need something, you know, new you mentioned about uh, new technology powered by AI, uh, that's very interesting. So definitely a very important point about keeping an eye on how technology is evolving and is assisting um, even a role like, uh, you know, yours, uh, which um, is very tough, Lynn. It's a tough life. Well, we're uh, trying to uh, work closely with our colleagues and offer a, you know, competitive and compliant service. So I want to I wanna leave our viewers with a more positive note, I hope. So you are looking at the crypto industry from um, behind the scenes and you see how things are moving to make this industry more, um, uh, how can I say, accepted, but in a way that is positively accepted and is actually can bring uh, uh, innovation rather than uh, you know, what we said, financial crimes come and all the bad things that can happen to customers. Um, how do you see the space evolving, let's say, over the next uh, five years? Is going to take 10 years for crypto to become mainstream? Is going to take less than that? How do you think we are positioned um, to kind of tackle these and in which terms you are thinking, short, medium or long? I think we'll see um, 
major impact and change within five years. And the reason is there is such a push for regulation to be uh, regulatory frameworks to be put in place and for there to be active engagement within uh, the fintech community globally and regulators to create a uh, base level playing field where everybody knows what the requirements are and the consumers can begin to trust more uh, when they are dealing with registered uh, regulated players. They will be able to start to have trust in those products and services. This is all about risk and controls. And a lot of fintechs are very light in terms of their um, internal processes. Uh, so we may use outside reg tools, but we might want to bulk up our you know, transaction management team and controls more. Uh, I think the regulators will want to see a lot more in terms of risk assessment, controls, uh, testing of effectiveness of your tools. So there, and, and also uh, uh, business continuity plans, having cushions uh, in case uh, you know we have a risk incident. So you have lots of things that you have in the traditional financial regulated framework that aren't yet fully uh, operating uh, in every single case with smaller fintech companies. So we need that um, regulatory framework to you know, put in place the requirements for the risk and controls to be fully effective everywhere, not just you know the UK or Europe. And once that takes place, we have very you know tough, demanding regulators like the MAS in Singapore. They have very high standards for uh, particularly for money laundering. So uh, Hong Kong has just taken some new, exciting moves to uh, approve an ETF framework. So they'll have new product opportunities that will be coming up in Hong Kong and in the Asian markets uh, because that regulator is moving ahead with that particular product set. So we're looking at opportunities for regulation to help us develop our products, but we can't do that until we have the risk and control frameworks fully effective and regulation will help that happen. So I think that's going to happen within the next three years, certainly five years. Brilliant. Lynn, I've got a couple of uh, questions, uh, maybe more fun questions, but what is a typical business day, working day in a life of uh, a head of compliance, MLRO in crypto land? Well, uh, it starts out at, uh, with the uh, morning call, uh, not just similar to the one you have on a trading floor, where you're chatting with your uh, relationship managers about what types of customers are coming in, uh, you have some uh, customers that may have some particular due diligence issues, so they bring that to our attention. We start running some uh, background checks on a key figure, for example. Let's say you have a sports figure that wants to make an application. You have to check those people out. So um, you also then look at your morning reports, if you have any transaction monitoring, um, any approvals for payments overnight for large payments. We have certain transaction limits. So we're going to have uh, anything that's exceptional will show up for a special approval. Uh, executive committee meeting, talk about licensing plans, uh, new applications, new countries we are interacting with, uh, looking at the risk assessment, if we've got any risks that need to be uh, sort of logged, um, checking our documents to come. We have a few documents that might need to be sent in because the scanning wasn't clear. I mean, it goes from the very tactical to um, and practical to um, sort of the higher level uh, regulatory topics. Um, we might have an industry association meeting and catch up with a lot of our colleagues. Occasionally, we have the opportunity to go and visit some of our customers um, and have a quarterly risk visit, stuff like that. Okay, what are your biggest headaches? Uh, I, I, I'd like to continue to get um, better scanning. Uh, if we're using online tools, I want the effectiveness of the online tools to continue to improve. I'd say some of our uh, reg tech tools are kind of intermediate in the level of effectiveness. So um, using APIs and getting better and better results uh, from all of those connections is something I want to see. Um, we have a very good uh, head of technology. So I know we're using the best uh, that we, we have available currently. I'd like to have better information tools to report financial crime. I think the tool that all of the industry is using in the UK 
uh, and you know, sort of standard government reporting tools everywhere. Uh, we probably could update those and um, have even more information provided to the National Crime Agency on uh, the crypto aspects of uh, what we're finding when we make a report. There are not very many good drop-down boxes for the crypto part of making your report. So some of that needs updating and improving. Um, but I do think the Financial Crime Agency puts out very interesting information about financial crime themes, and they're focused on big national issues like ransomware. So uh, where we're focused on what we see as individual customer or transaction situations. So they've got both the national uh, topics as well as the uh, tactical things coming into their website that they receive as reports. I'd like that reporting to get better and uh, more detailed for crypto-related transactions. I've got a bag of cash, and I'm going to come to you and say to you, to let's say, you know, like a, a bank or a banking service provider. And uh, let's say I come to Green Gage and say, I've got this bag of cash. I want to get an account with you. Well, oh, we, you don't, we don't accept cash. We don't have any type of uh, uh, physical uh, work, working with cash at all. So we would completely reject that. And we would just say, sorry, we don't handle any cash transactions. And that's not part of our risk appetite. So we, we would say no, and um, we would refer them probably to the post office, which does take cash deposits at the post office. They've recently reduced their limits sizably. So if someone came in with a very large amount of cash or tried to contact us to do that, we would say you'll have to go probably to a bank or uh, that you bank with or a post office, but there will be some limits that you will experience on a daily limit deposit. Okay. Lina, thank you so much for sharing uh, uh, your time with us and all this uh, very important insight on how we can fight financial crime. <laughs> thank you very much for having me.